Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, a festival of cases from custom pink to free NAS drive box and AMD Lano Judge, mid-price and high-end GPU upgrades, and the nightmare of BGA. All coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 126, recorded June 30th, 2011. Case study. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH7. And buy Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. My name is Patrick Norton, joined as always by the legendary, mythical, and shockingly homebound Ryan Shrout of PCPer.com. Hello, hello. Ryan. How are you doing today, Patrick? I'm excited, man. Uh, in desperate need of a haircut, but excited. Um, basically, the Lotto desktop processor is out, and you have been hands-on with it, I believe, sir? Uh, for quite a while now, yeah. <laughs> so a couple... A couple of weeks ago, the, the mobility version launched. We talked about that a little bit while I was uh, in Seattle for the AMD Fusion Developer Summit, actually out of town there. But yes, this is the actual release of the desktop variant, the, the, the physical processor that you plug into the physical motherboard and add physical memory, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, and that type of stuff. So um, I don't know what kind of questions you got. What, what, what thoughts and ideas do you have about it? What do you want me to, to, to address? Well, okay, so Core i3, Core i5 versus Lano desktops. Yes, no, maybe. So I'm going to go with uh, maybe on that. So <laughs> the, I guess to, in order to have this discussion, first little bit of information. Lano, I'm not going to go over what it is. We've all seen it. CPU, GPU combo, blah, 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 et cetera. What is uh, important to know that might be new information is that the Core, uh, the the uh, a series is what it's called. The A8 3850 is the model number, the highest end Lano that is being released this month. Uh, will sell for $135. Hmm. So that yes, hmm, is exactly right. So if you if you don't know much about the performance and you haven't seen some of the leaked information about it, your your first thought's going to be, well, okay, uh, that's either a totally awesome deal where it kind of puts the processor in the very budget market as opposed to kind of like the mainstream uh, gaming segment. Right. The, that, that puts the, uh, the competition for this part as the Core i3-2100, which is actually the lowest priced Sandy Bridge processor that Intel is currently selling in the retail channel. Um, so that gives you an idea of where you're at. So Core i3-2100 uh, is a dual-core hyper-threaded CPU. Mm -hmm. Lano, the 3850, is a quad-core, true quad-core processor, no hyper-threading or anything like that. Um, it fits in motherboards just like you're, you're used to seeing. It uh, looks like a normal motherboard. You can see there is a new processor socket up there. The little hole in the middle there indicates to you that this is not a AM3 or AM2+. Plus. It's socket FM1, 905 pins to be exact, if you're curious about that type of information. Uh, your heat, heat sinks will work. But if you're going to Lano processor, you do have to get a new motherboard. And there are board options out there from all the standard guys, ASUS MSI, uh, ASRock, ECS, Gigabyte. Anybody you can think of is right. going to have FM1 motherboards. So two segments in performance, CPU and GPU performance, because both the Sandy Bridge and Lano parts are hybrid, heterogeneous processors, APUs. If you're AMD, that's what they're calling them. CPU front. Uh, the... Processing cores, x86 cores on Lano are based on the STARS architecture, which was originally released with the Phenom core, uh, I believe, in January of 2007. We've seen mild upgrades in that core uh, from the Phenom to the Phenom 2. We've seen dual-core, quad-core, and six-core variants of mm -hmm. it. But uh, there is really no getting around the fact that the architecture itself, uh, though improved 5%, 6% here and there, 
is essentially a 2007 architecture and it doesn't change anything in terms of how AMD's CPU performance compares to Intel's CPU performance. The Lano 3850 runs at 2.9 gigahertz, which is not an extremely high frequency. The mm -hmm. Core i3-2100 runs at 3.1 gigahertz, so it's higher frequency. And Sandy Bridge is definitely a higher IPC, meaning instructions per clock. It's more efficient on a per core basis. So when you look at the CPU benchmarks, you will uh, undoubtedly see, uh, especially if you're looking at um, workloads that are single threaded or dual threaded or even if they're have, uh, even if they're multi threaded if they're not very efficient in that method the the core i3 2100 is faster and it's sometimes uh by an unfortunately large margin that does not sound good however this isn't really going to be an enthusiast part right this is probably more if you're looking for bargain desktops home theater pcs actually i think it has a lot of potential as a home theater pc it does, and that is because of the other half of the process. So that's actually mm -hmm. one of the things that AMD w was touting is like uh, about 50% of our core is for uh, GPU and about 50% of it is CPU in terms of transistor count. If you look right. at the Intel side of things, it's more like 20% for the GPU and uh, you know 70 or 80% for the CPU. When you look at the gaming benchmarks on our review, which there are quite a few of, uh, without a doubt, the, the Lano processor, the, the integrated graphics in there, they're, they're, uh, they're branding the, the HD 6550D, blow away the Sandy Bridge uh, 2100 graphics. Mm -hmm. Just out, blow it out of the water. In some cases, by a factor of four, and in wow. no case is it less than a factor of two. If we look at uh, our benchmarks, we went through 3D Mark Vantage, Civ 5, Dirt 3, Left 4 Dead 2, StarCraft 2, you know, those types of games. Um, what I kind of consider more mainstream titles. Uh, you know, you're looking at StarCraft 2, 50 frames a second versus 19 frames a second. The, I mean, those are significant differences where 19 frames a second is not really playable. So therefore, you could say StarCraft 2, 1680 by 1050, medium settings, you can't even play on the Core i3 processor. You can play that comfortably on the A8 3850 Lano uh, APU. So right. that, that's its big advantage is on, is on uh, graphics. Uh, now, you said home theater PC, and that's kind of interesting discussion, too, because what do you need from a home theater PC? You need video processing. You need, like, transcoding support right. and acceleration, and the the... Lano APU definitely does that. The GPU portion handles, you know, uh, video enhancements and, and uh, H.264 decode and transcoding acceleration and apps from like Cyberlink and ArcSoft and those types of guys. But Intel Sandy Bridge processors do that too. And in those applications that take advantage of the dedicated media transcoder, the quick sync technology, uh -huh. it is still faster than the APU. Oh. Um, that, I mean, that, that's what's happened. Even, even when right. we were testing Sandy Bridge uh, when it first came out against you know, higher performing discrete cards, the, the quick sync technology, if properly in, implemented in software, was faster, um, which then you kind of wonder what, el what else is put in a home theater then other than video performance. Right. You know, it, it's power. So and, do, I was going, okay, so are you leading up to revealing that, that the, 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 the new, the, the <laughs> sorry, I'm like having trouble with English. I mean, are, are you leading up to telling us that Lano has a considerably better uh, power envelope than the Core i3, or are you slowly building up to tell us that it's a nice processor, but you wouldn't want to bring it home to mom? <laughs> <laughs> More or less the latter one, I guess, because if you look at the power <laughs> consumption, just the processors, no discrete cards, mm -hmm. uh, the, the A3850 uses about 40 watts more power under a load than uh, the Core i3-2100 does. It's not, it's, I mean, it's not you know, going to kill you in, in terms of your electric bill, but in, in terms of running quiet and cool, it looks like Intel still has the advantage. So, Ouch. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, I don't, I don't know, if you look at a lot of other reviews uh, throughout the web, I mean, I've seen wild fluctuations of what these concluding paragraphs and pages really talk about. Some people have uh, no negatives against it, and it's a highly recommended item. And that to me is only the case if you are looking to build a budget gaming capable home theater PC, right? If, mm -hmm. if you're building a gaming system, I'm not going to recommend this still. If you want to play Crisis 2 at all, you know, I'm not going to recommend this type of system. But if you want a gaming capable 
computer, which I don't really know if that's even like a category of system, but um, this is far and away the best integrated graphics we've ever seen on a processor or chipset. It has that going for it. So, so systems that sell at retail uh, for $400 to $600 to $700, that those all use integrated graphics. You know, they should use, they should use AMD's Lano technology because they are going to perform the best in uh, the most general case uh, of usability for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So, it's. <sighs> It's tough for me. It's tough to say it. It's just like it's just, it's not a great part. It's not really what um, you know we're really hoping to see. We I, we didn't right. expect a whole lot in terms of CPU performance, and the GPU for, the GPU definitely impressed. But uh, you'd like to see a, you'd, you'd like to see the better GPU along with a better core that wasn't based on a four year old architecture at this point. Not that there's yeah, anything it's, wrong with it being old. Yeah, seems kind of greedy to want everything, right? But <laughs> uh, no, but the the problem is, is Intel has been delivering us so much for so long, uh, and doing such a magnificent job of of pushing the architecture and the process forward. It's it's really tough. And look, AMD's got some great enthusiast parts. They've got some really well-priced parts but you know we're looking towards next year and the year after and we want to see more mm -hmm. right <laughs> i guess i guess the last thing i'll kind of say about this well mm -hmm. first of all there's a lot of there's some other interesting things we won't get into here but if you go to my review at pcper.com you can see them obviously we have tons of benchmarks to kind of reiterate the cpu performance issue and then the gpu performance advantage that lano has but there's also things like uh, overclocking your memory now can have a significant improvement on your gaming performance right kind of overclocking memory is one of the things we didn't really worry about anymore right uh, with the integrated graphics con and the memory controller on lano it actually makes a difference noticeable difference uh dual graphics technology which is like hybrid crossfire you could plug in a 50 or 60 dollar discrete card here and the lano apu and the discrete card will work together and produce um, better gaming performance, but right. only on DX10 and DX11 titles, which to me is kind of backwards considering the market that you are targeting with $50 graphics cards. Mm -hmm. um, but the, my, my, my kind of concluding thought here was AMD really wishes that the price you could put on a processor was based on GPU performance. If, if that were the case, <laughs> this would be a $400 part because right. the best Sandy Bridge can offer uh, is, isn't able to beat this. But unfortunately, the market still demands and is, and is built around and based around x86 performance. You know, that's, if, if AMD came out and priced this at $400 and said, yeah, CPU performance not that great, but look how much we demolished them in GPU performance, nobody's going to buy it. OEMs, ODMs, right. system builders, none of that. They, they have to, they priced it $135 because they knew they had to attempt to at least try to be competitive in the x86 market. And until we see uh, applications and software um, beyond just video transcoding and games that takes advantage of GP, GPU computing, you know, this whole heterogeneous computing idea, it's going to be right. very difficult for AMD to compete with a product of this caliber. If they come out with a better product, great we'll readjust and, and discuss then you know next year type of thing but until something like that happens it's very hard for them to um compete in the wide scale market with with lano so i don't know all right more details check out the review <laughs> speaking of gpu acceleration bada boom the once nvidia only transcoding accelerator now works with <gasps> sandy bridge it's like pie in the face of our whole discussion we just had <laughs> You're the one who stacked this story <laughs> after it, the well, Lano story. I just, it kind, I it kind of defends my case. Right. That they it went with. Go ahead. Go, no, I was going to say, like, you know, Elemental Technologies um, originally dealt with NVIDIA CPUs. I don't know if that was like NVIDIA paid them to do that or if they felt NVIDIA had the most advanced technology. Probably but, a little both. You know, 1.1 version of the program, you've been hands on with it. And it was just. It, you know, it's great to have acceleration, but I thought it was kind of it was cold, harsh, cruel, painful that they <laughs> did not choose to adopt it to the AMD parts. Well, so, yeah, you're right. They started out with NVIDIA, and that was like their big partner. NVIDIA sold it on their website, actually. Right. Uh, this was when CUDA was first starting to take off their uh, NVIDIA's kind of like GPU programming languages and, and methodology and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It was very successful. It was the first time where you got a, a consumer piece of software that said, hey, look, you can take advantage of GPU processing. And it right. kind of eventually faded away from being just NVIDIA, and it would run on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. It will run on Lano. It will accelerate on Lano. Um, but the problem for both AMD and NVIDIA is that Intel is this enormous company that has 80-plus percent market share. So right. Bada Boom was like, you know, 
we're having fun hanging out with NVIDIA and, and, and selling it to, you know, these people who want to buy CUDA applications. But if we want to sell <laughs> a lot of pieces of software, where do we need to go? And, and, and they really needed to target what Intel Sandy Bridge offers. So, you know, the QuickSync technology is integrated into the newest version of Bada Boom. So it's actually much faster now than any of the GPU accelerated versions of Bada Boom. So you can buy, now you right. can buy it retail. And if you have an NVIDIA GPU uh, and not a Sandy Bridge part, you will get some acceleration. You will be faster than CPU processing alone. But if you have Sandy Bridge, it will be faster than that. So that's just, it, it kind of reiterates my previous point where Intel may be adapting later, mm -hmm. uh, just like it has over, the, it seems like the last 10 years, right? We talked about it last week or two weeks ago, the X64, 64-bit technology, the integrated memory controller. But when they finally decide to catch up, they can do it, and they have the support of the community and these developers that, you know, basically Intel took, added just a little bit of, uh, of transistor space on Sandy Bridge and took away 90% of the argument for needing a discrete GPU on notebooks and, and really, right. really low cost PCs. So, and that's, this is one of those, another one of those unfortunate kind of examples of that. <laughs> Right, but well, speaking of unfortunate, to make another graceful <laughs> transition, yes, uh, interesting stuff going on here in the state of California. As many of you know, uh, much like the rest of the United States, the state of California is struggling. Uh, it's basically in debt, needs money, and decided um, uh, to collect sales tax uh, on online sales to residents, or at least they mod. It's kind of interesting. They modified a state law that said if you have a physical presence in the state of California, for example, an Apple store, then you know the Apple store online would have to collect sales tax from the state of California. So they modified the law to say that if you have affiliate sales, of course Amazon has a lot of affiliates in the state of California. Those are people basically you click on an Amazon link from a web page and you get brought into uh, Amazon.com and the person who linked you there gets a cut, a percentage of VIG, mm. to use the North Jersey term, um, <laughs> on the sale. And uh, what's the VIG? I love that phrase. Um, so the state of Amazon, or the state of Amazon, the state of California told Amazon that they were going to have to start collecting sales taxes. And Amazon shut down all of the affiliate sales in the state of California. Said no, no, we really aren't going to collect sales tax for the state of California. Um, I only bring this up uh, not because we talk politics on the show, because I think we avoid it like the plague. Yes. But I think it's going to be something uh, to keep an eye out for, as you know the the. Congress has been shockingly good about pushing out uh, bans on collecting sales tax on internet, uh, internet sales, much to actually to the disgust of, and I think quite rightfully, of most local businesses who have to deal with brick and mortar costs and, and buying in smaller volumes and dealing mm. with, you know, actually collecting, uh, you know, state and local sales tax. Um, the uh, so it's going to be interesting to watch as states try to claw their way into more revenue, whether or not they're going to figure out a way to charge sales tax for you buying stuff off of the internet. Which in you know in the case of California, you know here in the Bay Area, you know that's a it's roughly ten percent, uh, a biscuit Ouch. under ten percent for, for right. most brick and mortar purchases. Uh, so this doesn't this doesn't like if you live in California, you can still buy things directly from Amazon.com. Right. So. The, the, the issue is, is they don't want to be responsible for collecting tax in all the, the states that their um, affiliates are based in? Basically, yeah. The, the state of California says, since you have an affiliate program in the state of California, we're going to make you legally collect sales tax. And, and you know, basically, you know, at the, 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 the Amazon said, no, actually, you sign this into law, we're killing all of our, our California affiliates, and they did. Um, <laughs> so um, it's going to be interesting, uh, you know. I mean, some uh, people make a living off of that, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> not not anymore. Um, well, yeah, they were until At least today. in the state of California. This, this <laughs> I don't think this is the first time that Amazon has done this, but it's, it's, it's a really... Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because California is the most populous state in the nation. So right. Amazon has is, is basically avoided building 80 facilities in the state just to avoid having to collect yeah, they sales built them tax. they in Kentucky instead. So thanks yeah. for that. Well, it's uh, – <laughs> sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> You know, basically, actually, no, I'm not going to apologize for helping to bring uh, jobs to the state of Kentucky. <laughs> but it's it's funny, right? Because you know, this this is not 
you know, this has a particularly high profile in California, uh, you know, but it's like the state of Illinois is working to uh, collect sales tax. Uh, I think California Virginia Hawaii, already did it. New Mexico, Minnesota, and Vermont are all playing around with legislature for this. Um, so it's, you know, Amazon's claiming it's unconstitutional and counterproductive. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we play by the same rules as other retailers as the national chains collect online only for states where they have physical stores. Paul Meisner, Amazon's vice president for public policy, said in a statement uh, reported in the New York Times. Um, you know, last fall, Texas sent Amazon a tax bill for $269 million, uh, <laughs> <laughs> after determining that the retailer's Dallas area warehouse owned by a subsidiary qualified as a local address under state tax rules. Uh, so basically, hmm. you know, this is this is something that Amazon is working very, very, very hard uh, to avoid doing, and something that will eventually uh, promises to impact all of us. Amazon is a huge target; so they are oh, yeah. such a huge online uh, a retailer. But I would not be surprised um, to see uh, state uh, legislatures target other online sales sources. And with that bright and cheerful note, we should take a bright and cheerful moment to thank one of our sponsors who brings us Twitch. That's right. We've got to make sure we can pay all of our taxes. <laughs> um, so uh, we will let everybody know that this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use user interface uh, for creating and managing website or uh, website or blog. Say you wanted to start a blog uh, campaigning against new taxes. Uh, in your local state. I'm just throwing that out there. It could be any number of topics. Maybe you want to write a blog about Lano performance and your experience is building a system on it, anything like that. Uh, the good news is, is Squarespace is optimized for beginners and experts. Uh, if you want to get down into the nitty gritty and CSS code, modify things yourself, you can do that, but you don't have to. You can start with templates and modify from there. They have hundreds of those templates to choose from and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. Uh, there are iPhone and iPad apps for updating your blog on the go. They have online resources and a special support team that can give you help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is an all-inclusive service, includes um, modules to build your website, like a blog module, form builders, Flickr photo displays, things like that, Twitter widgets, social media buttons, all those types of things. Um, but it also does website tracking, so you know how many times your site is viewed in a built-in search engine optimizer. It has permission access handling if you want to have multiple users uh, working on your blog at the same time. And it's built on a cloud architecture for speed and site stability, so you don't have to worry about uh, your site going down if you happen to get a lot of traffic from a slash dot or a dig or something like that. Hmm. Uh, you can use and should use Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it anytime. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account, no credit card needed, just try it out and start building your website today. Then if you decide to purchase it, if you use offer code, I believe it is Twitch7, Twitch and then the number seven, uh, you will get 10% off of your purchase for six months. So 10% off of six months of the surface is a really good deal. It's squarespace.com, offer code TWICH7, Twitch7. And we thank Squarespace for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Bulldozer delayed to the first quarter of 2012 and Intel Socket 2011 in September. Is that yeah, right? Intel Socket 2011? Uh, yeah, that's kind of yeah. Aren't they funny? Uh, <laughs> it's actually the number of pins and the year it's going to be released. Wow. So that's you know, a lot of pins. It is. It is a lot of pins, and it kind of is one of those reasons why Intel <laughs> moved away from actually putting the pins on the processor right. or on the motherboard, whereas AMD still has pins on the processor itself. Uh, so this was like it was kind of almost a throwaway story from Digitimes, where they're talking about oh, okay, in early July, AMD is going to release these FM1 based Lano processors. Uh, they're also going to announce a couple of new uh, Brazos based. Uh, Bobcat Core designed uh, some of the small form factor uh, fusion processors. And then you, we kind of did a little more reading here, and Digitimes is one of those places where you take it or leave it, whether or not you believe the information. Most of the time, I believe it turns out to be fairly accurate. Uh, they're saying the high-end Scorpius platform, which is built off of a uh, AM3 Plus 990FX chipset and the Bulldozer Core-based processor. Um, that's the next new CPU architecture that we are hoping will offer some better performance from uh, the AMD x86 land. 
will announce uh, they announced uh, what the SKUs were, but the um, majority of them were set for the first quarter of 2012, with a few of them at the end of September mm-hmm. uh, uh, this year. So it looks like they're going to be just barely be able to get a couple of those out before the end of the year, with a majority of them coming out later in 2012. Um, that's kind of there's been many delays on the bulldozer architecture so this one's just kind of like another one in in the, <laughs> in the series of succession here but what's bad news for amd is that this article also mentions that on the other hand intel is also prepared to launch its high-end x79 chipset after september along with 11 upgraded cpus including the core i5 2320 blah 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 and other model numbers that don't really mean much to us yet right. uh, the key here is that x79 chipset along with uh upgraded processors coming in september as well likely as a direct response to what bulldozer will offer so even if amd was planning on coming out with a 350 400 processor going right up against sandy bridge we'll be very curious what these new parts like the core i5 2320 actually change how the performance actually differs from what exists today Mm -hmm. and if amd will again be stuck having to lower the price of their processor down to where they are competitive in the x86 market that would have to hurt. I mean, that would really have to hurt at this point. Yeah, um, after years of development, and, and, you know, it's one of those things where I'm glad I don't have to deal with it, but there's so much, you know, you have to plan. You're going to launch Bulldozer. You have to start planning actual product release dates 24 months in advance, and meanwhile, your competitors over there are moving around, too. It's never a set-in-stone thing. It's always, it's always moving. That's why I tend to be a little bit more forgiving of delays and that type of thing um, up to a point, I guess, so... There you have it. So interesting thought from uh, IBM, who still does a, an amazing amount of primary research on yes. technology. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the IBM, okay, they sold off ThinkPad, they sold off most of their consumer stuff uh, to Lenovo, but they still do some monster primary research. These raw patents that generate huge amounts of wealth uh, are at the core of, yep. of IBM. And uh, uh, device.com was was posting a story ultra fast faintest change memory is coming to a, a computer near you and IBM announced they've quote figured out a way to make phase change memory a commercial reality within five years um, what's in it for you well how does accessing your data about a hundred times faster sound the idea that uh, uh, phase change memory uh, uses a particular a peculiar material that changes its form. Um, when heat is applied to the material, it changes its structure. It becomes amorphous rather than crystalline, and that basically means hmm. the electrical resistance of that particular, that would essentially be a bit, right, a little chunk of this material. Um, huh. By reading these resistances, you can tell whether the PCM is holding a one-bit or a zero-bit. All this happens very, very fast, quote, about 100 oh. times faster than contem- excuse me, conventional flash memory. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, uh, PCM phase change memory would be as fast as DRAM, but it can remember your data uh, without having power applied to it, uh, even over, quote, 10 million write cycles or more. My, I think my favorite line of the story you linked to, or this favorite uh, sentence here, uh, it, it addresses one of the problems. There are two big problems with phase change memory. <laughs> Problem one is that over time, months and years, electrons in the phase change material get bored and start to wander around, messing with the electrical resistance and potentially corrupting your data. Uh, and it says, it describes a little bit of how they were able to, to work around that and type of fix it. But <clears throat> I like the idea of my electrons wandering around and getting bored and corrupting my data. Actually, I don't, but <laughs> it's interesting that they would word it in such a way. So yeah, I mean, you, lo- you look at what it's IBM is scientific, able to do. Very, very yeah. scientific term. Electrons start to wander. I mean, they get you know, bored like, and they just start floating around. It's like the beginning of a quantum physics class. <laughs> I mean, 10 million write cycles or more, uh, that would definitely right. address some of people's concerns with uh, MLC flash that we're talking about in a lot of our solid state drives and the PCI Express solid state drives and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> but they're, they're, so they mentioned that that is one of the problems, power being mm-hmm. another problem that will potentially be addressed by the magic of carbon nanotubes. Always with the nanotubes. Uh, yeah, well, the, the interesting thing is, is, is the carbon, they're claiming the carbon nanotubes could reduce PCM power consumption by a factor of 100, uh, which is Seems a important. big deal, or 1,000, um, which is also a big deal, an even bigger deal, because um, the one problem with, with PCM phase change memory is that it requires a great deal of electricity to change phase from the crystalline structure to the ah. amorphous structure. 
So gotcha. it'll be really interesting to see how this shakes out. Do not expect it, however, much before 2016 on the enterprise side and sometime well after that for consumers. Interesting. All right. Uh, well, we're going to get into our emails here now. If you please email us your questions, your comments. We've got several of each of those uh, for today. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv is the address for that. Uh, we need your questions and ideas. Uh, <clears throat> even if you have ideas about what you want us to cover in the next week's show or, or ideas for <laughs> little segments and that kind of stuff, let us know. We're always right. interested in that. Um, but we did get an email that uh, we're going to start off with here. And uh, Patrick has s some very helpful advice for us here on, <laughs> on some of these different things. It's interesting. So this is from Laura, and it's about uh, accessories and PC components. She asks, I just recently finished my gaming build, and it is a great machine. However, mm -hmm. as I was building it, I couldn't help but wish there were more girly accessories and computer parts to go with my build. I found a couple of pink cases, but they were all bad, with poorly manufactured <laughs> internal components, cheap plastic sides and molding, and bad chassis design overall. I ended up having to settle for a Cooler Master 690ii case, which is all black, of course, and the plain blue SATA cables that came with my Intel motherboard. I could mod my case, but I don't know what kinds of paint to get, and I'm afraid of screwing it up. Do you know of any supplier that makes good pink hardware for female computer enthusiasts, or do you have any good beginner tips for modding a black case? Um, so that, that was interesting. Obviously, this is not something I've done a whole lot of research on. Uh, but Patrick has done a lot of research on these types of modifications and, and what different <laughs> options you have available there. Apparently, you built a furry system once. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say it like that. Okay, I, all right. Because saying <laughs> I, I build a system for furries usually gets me a lot of really interesting email. Yes. Um, so, okay, first of all, let's, let's state this out right. A lot of cases are bad, not just the pink ones. Um, a lot of cases <laughs> are poorly thought out, poorly made, made from cheap materials, underbuilt, built by people who don't ever think about the hands and fingers that will have to go inside of the cases, leaving them raw and bleeding, uh, or even particularly, you know, they, they tend sometimes do not think a lot about doing things like making it easy to route cable inside of the, the device, not having to say, pull your cooler off of your CPU so you can swap in a new hard drive, stuff like that. So there's a lot of bad cases. Don't feel targeted because you like pink. Right. Um, that said, uh, you know, patience is if you if you're thinking about painting a case, your number one tool is patience because a really good paint job is 90 percent preparation and 10 percent painting, and then another 90 percent of patience uh, a, as you finish kind of the the process. The the easiest way to screw up a, a paint job, whether you're talking about furniture or a car or a PC case, is by rushing it. Um, you know the uh, it also it kind of depends on your standards. If you've ever been to a, a, a car show, like a really serious car show, it can be absolutely astonishing to see the finishes that people manage to coax mm -hmm. out of older vehicles. And you talk to some of these guys, and they're like, yeah, you know, I got like 35 grand tied up in the paint job. Or, you know, maybe they don't have 35 grand tied up in the paint job, but they spent a year. Uh, of weekends and evenings sanding and prepping and sanding and yeah. prepping and sanding and prepping and sanding and prepping and sanding and prepping before they spent like five grand having somebody uh, blow the paint on the car. If you do uh, some searches around, search for mirror paint job for a case or two or three uh, articles that people have done that basically go through how you, you know, basically the sanding, the prepping, um, you know, and and all of the points because it's there's you know I'm I am not a paint expert. I I I would love to be a better you know better man with a spray gun than I am. I can do okay with a can of rattle. You know, I can do an okay rattle can job when it gets serious. Uh, I usually admit that I don't have the patience um, yeah, <laughs> to put here. the time in. You know, I've I have a truck that I I am going to slowly but surely do the right way, but it will probably be the only thing other than a house I paint the right way in my life. Um, if you don't want to invest a lot of time learning how to prep or if you are afraid of the painting process once you get the thing prepped, uh, talk to a local auto body shop or two and tell them, hey, I, I want to spray paint this case, or uh, talk to a local powder coating shop. Powder coating is this amazing process where they essentially, powder coating works on metal, not on plastic so much. 
but they essentially, you're going to strip the, the, the case down, uh, they're going to spray a powder on it, they put the case in an oven, they bake it, and it becomes this unbelievably, relatively impervious substance compared to paint. Uh, and it could be absolutely fantastic looking in a, in, in a, vari a variety of covers. Uh, I covered a MacBook lid with fur for an episode of System. Uh, and, you know, I've one of the coolest PCs I ever saw was actually uh, covered with artificial grass. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had, huh. had, had basically covered a PC case in Sinlon, and if you do something like that, whether it's fur or Sinlon, or you know, basically mod podging, uh, do a search for that. It's a real project or a real product uh, uh, fabric onto a PC case. Um, you know, a lot of it's making sure you don't actually cover any of <laughs> yeah, the important air slots. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and uh, good. Mod Podge is still being sold. That makes me very happy. Um, nice. You know, the, the, I just uh, put a link in the show notes to. Um, <laughs> uh, apparently, there was a case shown at Computex mm -hmm. just earlier in the month um, from NZXT, which makes some really good, high quality PC cases. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was the NZXT Phantom. I don't know if we have that. Uh, if yeah, there it is. So that's that's pink. This is one that they said started as an April Fool's joke where they published about it type of thing, but then they got such a good response from it uh -huh. uh, that they decided that they were going to produce it. Uh, they don't say um, how much it's going to be or when it's going to be available, but they were showing it off. They were talking about availability, so it might be something that um, if you're really looking for a pink case like that, Laura, you might go to NZXT's website, find a contact form, and email them and, and right. express your interest, say, hey, I really want one of these. How much is it going to cost? You know, and hopefully it's not like a four hundred dollar limited edition <laughs> type case or something like that. But if you want enthusiast level chassis design and features, mm -hmm. I mean that's about as pink as you're going to get. Yeah. Speaking of which, that reminds me, there's a bunch of manufacturers that do uh, uh, custom painted cases um, from like automotive style airbrushing to. I'm trying to remember. There was a company that also did. Um, Oh gosh, what's the name of the custom color Xbox? Let's see if it comes up. There's a company that used to do these amazing um, colorware.com. Oh, uh, yeah. They still do, let's see, they've got, looks like they still have PC, like uh, PS3s and Xbox 360s. And I wonder if they do a case. Wow, look at that. Uh, if you go to colorware.com and then click on the computer links, they have some incredible colors on, on iPads and Apple wireless keyboards and magic trackpads and audio engine speakers. But sadly, I do not see a generic PC case. Hmm. Um, rats. So, close. okay, that's close. So close. I do like the <laughs> MacBook. Um, that's kind of trippy. Um, so we should probably bring this question to a close, but definitely, uh, definitely there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. I would actually like to see a giant pink Muppet-like furry case um, just because I watch a lot of Muppets with my son and uh, the idea like of a happy, Muppets. bouncy computer <laughs> with uh, big, giant Muppet facial expressions has a lot of, uh, has a lot of possibility, but I also <laughs> may be a freak. Um, but uh, one last thing before we move on is, uh, generally speaking, it is almost always easier to paint metal than plastic if you do mm -hmm. have a lot of plastic in your case. I don't think uh, your Cooler Master 690, uh, it does have some plastic molding on the front, I think, but most of it's metal. Uh, check out Krylon Fusion. It's available in the big box stores, generally available in a lot of smaller hardware stores, too. Um, that'll make it a little easier to paint the plastic sections of the machine. All right. And that's about all I can think of off the top of my head. So. All right. Well, uh, I guess before we get through uh, a host of other emails, we do have to thank the second of today's podcast sponsors. We will go ahead and say thanks to Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several ways to instantly access these streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. Uh, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad uh, with the new iPad app, which is actually really good. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones too. I know uh, the, the list of Android phones is growing. I know the HTC Evo 4G that I have is supported there. Uh, if you have a gaming console, 
like an Xbox 360, PS3, or a Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV that way as well. If you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV uh, or a Roku box. Uh, they're inexpensive and, and pretty easy to use as well. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices, and you can begin watching a movie uh, or show on one device and then finish it on a different one. So it's kind of like having a multi-room DVR, only it's multi-station throughout the country and throughout the world, wherever you have access to your Netflix account. Uh, whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, anytime you want, and you can cancel at any time if you're not happy with the service. But I, I think you will definitely be satisfied. Uh, try Netflix today for 30 days, completely free. Go to netflix.com slash twit, T-W-I-T. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for the free trial, netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Tech, This Week in Computer Hardware, and uh, hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. One more thing before we uh, move on from case modding. Uh, one of the folks in the chat room mentioned performancepcs.com is a place that has a lot of interesting custom cases, which led to a link on that page for custom automotive grade case painting service, which was like 700 yeah. bucks, which about made my oh. heart stop. Mm. But uh, that led me to the MNPC Tech dot com pro case modding and supplies and i forgot uh what amazing stuff that place has uh billet radiator grills which would be basically radiator grills carved out of aluminum and then an entire section of case mod services and hmm. some how to's um it's pretty cool stuff if you want to see just how extreme people are getting with case mods i would uh i would highly uh, recommend checking that out and the case mods tutorial uh, where did it go? There it is. Uh, basically, mnpctech.com slash case mods tutorials has some really good mm. stuff on uh, full of ideas for modding your systems and painting. And I particularly love the aluminum feet they have available and uh, window etching if you want to get really crazy with stuff. I remember I used to, I had a, I had the AMD MB logo etched in a, in a window on a case many years ago, many years ago. We do have another email about a case. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring up from John here. He says, um, I enjoy hearing you mentioned reusing your computer case i currently have a sandy bridge build housed in a seven-year-old hp case it has held a 400 uh, a, a 478 pen celeron a 775 uh, socket pentium 4 and a 775 socket core 2 uh, and now a socket 1155 i3 cases can be really cheap but it is clearly a case of you get what you pay for so I found a solid one, and I'm sticking with it. By the way, the harness for the power button and the LEDs is original, too. Never had to repin it. Enjoy the show, and always looking forward to the next episode. Um, Pardon me. Bless you. Uh, so that, it's, again, not a question, a, a valid point here. So he has a 7-year-old Hewlett-Packard computer case that has gone from a 478 Celeron to 775 Pentium 4 to Core 2, and now a Sandy Bridge-based design. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive in terms of especially, Patrick, I know you uh, completely support <laughs> reusing of hardware, especially things like that. I'm trying to remember, the, I'm trying to think of the oldest case I have right now, and I want to say it goes back, I just got rid of one that was originally um, a Cyrex case. <laughs> um, That's showing age there too, yeah. But, you know, it was built like a tank, and it just, you know, it holds an ATX motherboard, and everything was golden. But, yeah, I got to say, one of the, my favorite things to do is recycling PC cases, and then sort of, you know, as I do major upgrades, I can sprinkle those older parts into other people's PCs. Um, but, uh, it, you know, you know, find a case you like, keep building it forever is a really, really good idea. So... Dude. We should probably talk about Scott's question, too, while we're talking about cases. He says, okay. I would like to build a home NAS box. That's a networked attached storage box. It's a big pile of hard drives uh, that has the ability to serve data over your home network or your corporate network. He says he hasn't found any great cases for it. I would like something not too big and semi-quiet would be great. I would like space for five to six, three and a half inch drives for data and possibly one small form factor drive for the operating system. He says, I'm a Unix guy by day, and I'm planning to use either FreeNAS or Solaris. I'm a big fan of ZFS, in which case you should know that ZFS is now implemented in the latest version of FreeNAS in some pretty slick ways. He says, I haven't built a system in years. If you have any other motherboard recommendations, that would also be highly welcome. Thanks for a great show, Scott. Um, 
you could shop around, you know, for a case with upteen drive slots. Um, for 40 bucks with a probably atrocious power supply, uh, you can find the Tent Bay computer case, 550 watt, 984 inch, uh, up on Amazon.com. Uh, that's got 10 drive slots inside of it. Uh, if you want to go a little more high end without a hard drive or without a uh, I'm going to say it doesn't come with a uh, power supply, but there's the Antec 1200, which has 12 drive bays, um, or just buy a prefabbed drop-in drive case. I, I got to be honest, I'm going to say something that's going to cause probably howls of terror in the chat room, or at least from several people commuting and uh -oh. listening to the podcast, which is I have on occasion basically just double stick tape drives inside of cases and ran them that <laughs> way for years. Um, that said, you should be smarter than I am. Uh, oh, goodness. And if, and if you want to, you know, let's say you've got a case line around the house you want to reuse and it only has a couple of three and a half inch drive slots. Um, uh, you could take a look at uh, prefab drop in drive cages. Um, there's a pretty good one I found up on Google. I think the link is up there uh, for five and a quarter inch drive bays. Uh, it basically converts a bunch of five and a quarter inch drive bays into. Um, Two, 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 three and a half inch drives. You can find like the Thermal Take I Cage. I think has three drives and a fan. And there's some other ones out there. Uh. <laughs> the problem I came when I was looking through different cases to to address his need was it's trying to find a case that has that many uh, hard drive bays, but yet is still kind of like small and micro. You know, my my first thought was, well, you could get like a two U rack server or something ah. like that. No, but, you, you know, know what? That's what I think of small think and of micro. Dense. Put it, put it. In a, don't put it in a closet, especially a closet that doesn't have good airflow. Put it yeah. in the basement and and use Ethernet to connect it to your to your right. you know gigabit switch. Um, don't don't worry about. I mean, unless you do have space constraints, um, there's a couple smaller cases, but it's almost impossible to get a smaller case that's got that, that'll even fit two three and a half inch drives with with any degree of right. grace and then you end up using okay you can external eSATA and then all of a sudden you're dropping you know 60 to, to 180 bucks for an external eSATA drive enclosure yep. which actually is probably worth mentioning if somebody does have a smaller like you know there's i've seen some uh atom powered uh, systems that aren't particularly useful at this point for for opening web pages because Flash has gotten so complicated it kicks the snot out of a single core Atom processor, but that might still have enough oomph to serve data. And it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm looking for somebody that's done benchmarks for um, free NAS performance against different CPUs, but there are um, eSATA-based external cages, and I don't think I've seen one that's bigger than five drives. <laughs> Scott didn't specify what kind of computer he was building, right? Like full, right. if he was going to use like a full-size ATX or anything like that. If he's using a mini ITX, one he might check out is a Lian Lee has a PC Q08B, which is a black aluminum mini ITX tower. And it kind of looks like a cube, um, but it does have six three and a half inch bays internal. Um, which is quite a bit. When you look at the case, you know it looks right. like kind of like a small, cute thing. It can get away with that because it's a mini ITX form factor. It's not going to fit a micro ATX or uh, a full size ATX motherboard in it. So if you're going down that route, you know you can look at some of the mini ITX options that might be uh, more dense. Mm -hmm. if that's what he's looking for. Dense. It's all about density. Indeed. Um, yeah, that Sans Digital, the HD rack, HDD Rack Five, basically a five bay hard drive rack case, available for like under thirty bucks online. Has a fan built in to help keep things keep things cool. Um, and you know, external eSATA drive systems might be good, uh, depending on yeah. what what your restrictions are. Um, in terms of what kind of hardware you're running. But, um, you know, the other thing I haven't seen is how FreeNAS handles like USB 3.0. Then you start getting mm. into spending a lot of money <laughs> for external USB 3.0 yeah. drive yeah. enclosures. Carter's got a question about a GPU upgrade. He says, I just completed a nice Intel Core i7 Sandy Bridge rig and need to upgrade my video card. I'm currently running an old NVIDIA GT8500 with a gig of video <laughs> RAM, but it is just short of the GT88. Oh, no, it's a lot short. They it say is. you need a GT8800 for Crisis 2, but you know what? The minimum specs for video games are lies. Um, if you want to play it at like you know QVGA 320 by 240 in the center of your your 21 inch uh, <laughs> flat panel, that GT8800 will do just fine. Um, nice. 
He says, which, was that too harsh? Which would be better for me to do uh, buy one $300 video card and run it at 16X my PCI Express main slot or get two $150 cards and run them at 8X in two slots and use SLI or Crossfire with a new Core i7 Sandy Bridge system? I am anxiously awaiting your opinions. Uh, opinion. So he's got a Core i7-2600K Sandy Bridge CPU on the Asus P8 P67 Pro motherboard, uh, two gigabytes of Obsidian RAM from OCZ, uh, an OCZ 500 watt power supply, an OCZ Agility 60 gigabyte SSD. It's got a, a really nice rig. Yeah, that is a really Exception nice rig. Exception of the 8500. You know, uh, I would just I would just swap in if it's me and and I'm cheap. I would say you know buy the $300 video card for a single slot and wait for. Uh, the the gaming performance to slow down. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I I would agree with that. I I think um, you know Crossfire and SLI can be cost effective in in, in some instances. For example, a pair of GTX 460s right. uh, will outperform a GTX 570, but cost less or, or something to that effect. Um, which you can definitely do your research on or that specific example and and do that. If you're going to spend $300 anyway and you're comfortable spending $300 today, I think it always makes sense to get it all in one graphics card unless there's a huge difference between, you know, a crossfire and a single GPU configuration. Right. Um, that, that just seems to make a little bit more sense to me. Just for reference, I did look up the 8500 GT, uh, and it has 16 CUDA cores that run at 450 megahertz. Uh, compared to a GTX 580 that has 512 cores that run at about 800 megahertz. So there's a significant difference between um, that and what is available today. Hmm. Yeah. It does get it's, you thinking. We got an email from uh, Dusan? Dusan? Dusan uh, works for me. Dusan? Uh, about a gift. Who writes, I'm planning a birthday gift for my wife who is an avid PC gamer while I am not. I know a thing or two about computing, though my focus is on a very different type. So I know positively that her system is up-to-date, cutting edge, but for the uh, but for a video card, which is a GeForce 280, probably GTX 280. Uh, my idea is to get her the GTX 580 graphics card uh, from Quick Online Education. About it, I chose the MSI Lightning version. However, one conundrum remains that even PC per reviews haven't helped untie. There are two versions, 1.5 and 3 gigabytes. PC per comparisons show that it may be pointless to get 3 gig version as it may underperform uh, compared to the other one. Hmm. She plays all her games on a 30 inch Dell display, 2560 by 1600, and she plays games of the Elder Scroll type, Lord of the Rings, Mass Effect 2, Dragon Age, and uh, the aim is to have this completed system carry her for two years. Any advice on this particular case? Everything the best and good twitching, <laughs> which is which is a good saying. We should we should keep that around. Um, so I, I guess I didn't know the MSI Lightning comes in at 1.5 and a three gigabyte variant. Mm -hmm. I think I did know that, but kind of forgot. Uh, I don't see. I don't think the advantages uh, of that additional frame buffer is really going to make a difference and I'm going to cheat here and I'm going to um, try to look up the price a difference between them I imagine it's kind of steep mm -hmm. to double the memory from 1.5 to 3 gigs and um, let's see what are we looking at here a 580 so that is going to run you the, the GTX 580 is 525 uh, <laughs> and then the Three gigabyte version is slowly loading. Slowly, loading. <laughs> I don't know. But I, either way, I think the 1.5 gig is going to be more than enough. We do yeah. all of our testing and benchmarking on a 30 inch display, 2560 by 1600. Um, so I don't think you have to worry about um, anything like that. Are there any cards in that the, the GTX 580 GTX price range that you would rather uh, Tucson was looking at? Um, I mean, so, it, well, actually, there, there, I shouldn't say that, you know, is there, there's, there's not a lot in the $600 card range. <laughs> right. The only card that I would put above the GTX 580, if you wanted to, you know, just get the best possible option out there is the 6990. And those are um, a little bit more difficult to find. Actually, Newegg is completely out of stock on all of them. And they're in the $710 range going up. 
to eight ninety nine if you want the water cooled variant. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the GTX five eighty is probably the, the the better card for this solution. Although again, I, I will say if you're not if you're not super tied to the lightning card, which is a great card, but it's really meant for people who are going to overclock. If she's going to do that, by all means, uh, it has a lot of, of additional power regulation and, and control and that kind of stuff that standard GTX 580s don't have. Uh, but you can get, you know, a Galaxy GTX 580 for 450 bucks with a $40 rebate on top of that, or you can get an EVGA one uh, that is C price and cart, uh, 469 plus a $30 rebate. So you can save a little bit of money uh, and get. A, a kind of more reference design GTX 580 if you want if she's just going to plug it in and go because I don't think the lightnings are overclocked a little bit but they're meant to right. be toyed with by an enthusiast and if she wants to do that more power to her and hey by the way you should play more PC gaming with her <laughs> not a lot of guys are that lucky to have a wife that wants to do that so take advantage that's what I would do I like it Tyler says, I always wanted a visible, concrete, real-world example of how GPU processing compares to CPU power. I know GPUs are highly specialized, but it's difficult to visualize what that implies, which is why Ryan spent so much time running benchmarks. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of Bitcoin, says Tyler. Making new coins involves running calculations on different inputs until you find one that matches a certain pattern. What you need is a computer that can run as many SHA-256 hashes per second as possible. When I put my top-of-the-line Core i7-980X to the task, it could calculate 8.7 million hashes per second. Not bad. I also have a pair of high-end GPUs, ATI-6970s. They're not the best, but they're up there. When I put those to the task, they can together do about 8 million hashes per second. 800 hundred. 800 million hashes per second. That's 100 times faster than my GPU, which is among the best you can buy. In other words, for specific calculation types, a single modern GPU has the processing power of a small data center full of high-end computers. Wow. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, cross-platform comparisons uh, are always tough. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's it's it, and it's also really interesting when you realize that certain. Um, I used to do a lot of kind of cross-platform testing, looking at like you know back when there were still risk processor options for Windows NT. You could actually buy I want to say Photoshop, and there was an NT version, and there mm. was a regular x86 version, and it got really interesting because it turned out for certain algorithms in Photoshop for certain effects, they actually had different algorithms depending on the actual size of the photo it was being processed, processed, and then the, uh, for variations against you know for different versions of the OS so you could you could have a different the same task could be done by a different chunk of code that handled the data in a different and therefore would take a different amount of time to handle it depending on which operating system you used how big the file was which platform the operating system was running on and it gets really complicated but this is a really nice example you know assuming the bitcoin uh, algorithm is optimized for the core i7 platform and i would i would greatly assume that it is it's amazing to realize um, how many calculations can be handled by modern GPUs. But, as Ryan will tell you, that's the whole point of buying a more expensive GPU because it adds more. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Lost what, are we, what are we? Sorry. <laughs> well, just thinking about like like when you look at the the the, the number, I can't. I get part of the reason I did that ugly little toss was because I couldn't remember the name of the cores inside of a GPU that actually do the calculations. Oh um, well, it, it, and that's where it gets really yeah. You know, I mean, there's uh, CUDA cores is what Nvidia calls them. Radeon cores is what AMD calls them now. Stream processors is kind of what I like to to term them for the generic. Right purposes but it's interesting we got this email in because uh just yesterday we finished i think we tested 14 different graphics cards on bitcoin capability <laughs> just for fun right see what they do and we're going to write up a little piece on uh just which ones were the most efficient at it uh we're going to test lano on it as well see how the gpu on it does um, <laughs> and, you know one of the things that i thought was really interesting about this whole uh 
market of bitcoins and, and GPUs needed to, to find them and mine them. And then this, right. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what they're doing is uh, the, the radio so far, what most people think is the Radeon 5830 is the most efficient GPU mm -hmm. in terms of cost per coin, Bitcoin. <laughs> right? So people are buying these. I think you can get them for around a hundred bucks when they're on, when they're online, but they sell out instantly because these miners are apparently making money. They're like making enough money uh, in bitcoins over like as little as a month to pay for the price of that graphics card and then everything after that is all profit. And so right. it's interesting to see this whole dynamic that has been created that I still can't grasp completely yet. But I understand how to benchmark <laughs> things and how to compare them and you know we'll look at power consumption differences and all that kind of stuff too. So maybe next week we'll be able to talk uh, yeah. a little bit intelligent, intelligently about what that actually does. But yes, we, we are definitely seeing that. Um, just, just remember the first rule of currency speculation that it's it's usually very non-rational, unless you're yes. a professional. <laughs> it's it's so it's so intriguing to me that right. like the, this this program actually started out as being a CPU based thing, mm -hmm. but as people mine more, it becomes harder and harder to actually find more coins because the algorithms are further and further out, and then. You know, so CPUs were almost worthless in that regard. So that's why they right. went to making uh, these GPU computing applications uh, because it was taking, you know, modern processors just couldn't do anything anymore. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a whole big deal. I, I'm interested in reading on it from a, a I, I don't want to mine anything. Although if we wanted to mine here, we have the graphics cards to mine. I was uh, going to say. You might just start it as a side business, at least one until of, you know it could shut down. <laughs> one of our projects was to uh, we've got we've got two motherboards here that each have seven PCI Express slots, wow. and we thought, okay, let's find the most powerful graphics cards, fill them up all the way, and see how much we can build. Uh, <laughs> how much? First of all, how much power can you consume, and then how many coins can we get per day on right. a rig, quite like this? So, it's interesting. It's yeah. It's and uh, if you if you are kind of curious about uh, currency and how currencies uh, might exist in the digital world, and you like sci-fi or at least science fictionist stuff uh, that has a strong historical bent, check out Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson, uh, which kind of. Para looks at the two parallel characters, one in World War II, one in the late 20th century, uh, one of whom is is dealing with uh, cryptography and breaking cryptography. Mm. for the allied war efforts and on the other side uh, a, a gentleman is working to create systems that will protect encrypted data basically a, a an encrypted current currency um, and it's a really interesting concept from from a political science standpoint it's a really fascinating an economic standpoint it's a really fascinating concept um, so we close with one last email from Patrick about upgrading a sure. slate CPU this one's Patrick, not difficult to answer no, it's it, it's a classic question. We get some variation of it every so often. Patrick says, I was wondering if it's possible to create an Intel Core i5. Should be to upgrade the Intel Core i5 in my Asus EP121 tablet. I like the idea of having a little more power and better battery life. Any help would be appreciated. Love the show. Um, there have been in the past a small subset of notebooks that had upgradable processors. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, in most cases, the ones where you can actually do it were these and they don't really exist anymore, these behemoth, gigantic, like nine pound uh, notebooks. And I put notebooks in brackets because they were actually running uh, desktop CPUs in a notebook. They were power hungry. They usually had like a half an hour of battery life. They were stupid fast for a notebook. They were also stupid loud, stupid heavy, but you might be able to lift the keyboard up and drop in a new CPU, at least for a generation before they, they changed the uh, pinout. Um, you know, and occasionally there have been cases where you could maybe pull a module out and upgrade the, the CPU. But for all intents and purposes, the motherboards inside of notebooks these days, if to upgrade the CPU requires replacing the entire logic board uh, or motherboard. Um, and mm. it's the same nightmare, only on a smaller scale with tablets. Um, if you've never seen it, do a search, Patrick, for BGA or Ball Grid Array. Uh, mm -hmm. Check out the Arendelle BGA uh, pictures if you get a chance. And essentially, you know, the, the, the tablet, the, the CPU inside your tablet, um, 
they heated up the, the chip, they heated up the motherboard, they, they put this processor down on it, this BGA, it has little balls of solder underneath the bottom of it most likely, mm -hmm. and they heat that up and then they suck the solder down through the holes in the logic board, relatively permanently attaching that CPU to the logic board. Now, if you find out that there is a part you can actually buy, and by the way, buying mobile parts raw is normally difficult to do, but if you find out that there is a part you can buy uh, and you want to spend a lot of quality time learning, go to sparkfun.com and start learning about <laughs> surface mount components and then start spending some time uh, online with people who like to play with surface mount components and you might be able to sort of get your oven, like pull the logic board out and get an oven and find out where you can buy this part, maybe on eBay, maybe by buying a compatible notebook that somebody broke the monitor or trash <laughs> and hopefully the CPU right. still actually works. The short answer though, uh, is even assuming the CPU is electrically and thermally compatible with the power envelope uh, uh, and the thermal envelope on your tablet, it is probably more constructive for you to save your money <laughs> and, and wait to buy a faster tablet if one becomes available. It is, it is, it is almost impossible uh, to upgrade a CPU for, uh, for any normal human being. I mean, yes. um, I, I knew somebody who upgraded the uh, 486. Remember the, the, the ThinkPads where you opened up the lid and the keyboard butterflied out? Um, no. You were probably... But that sounds cool. It was an amazing piece of hardware, <laughs> and one of the guys that who who worked in the labs at IBM loved that notebook so much. He actually soldered, you know, pulled it apart, pulled the motherboard out, and soldered an upgraded uh, CPU on it. And he said, you know, if he hadn't had at the time, it was, you know, uh, IBM was still part of of. Uh, of, or I used to say ThinkPad was still a part of IPM. If he's basically, he was like, if I didn't have access to kind of this lab and all this sophisticated equipment, there's no way I could have done it. And he's like, right. if I did, you know, um, you know, is Patrick, it's a, it's a lovely idea, but generally speaking, notebook manufacturers, tablet manufacturers build hardware to be replaced, not upgraded. Correct. It's the sad, sad truth. <laughs> Twitch at twit.tv is the email address. We love your questions. You can also send them to us on Twitter. I'm Patrick Norton, at Patrick Norton on Twitter, at Ryan Shrout is my partner's name on the Twitter, the man, the myth, the legend. You got anything exciting other than, of course, the magnificent festival of Bitcoin minting? Uh, so, yes, we, do have our, <laughs> we, have our, we have our Bitcoin discussion. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, more discussion on Lano. We're going to talk about it from an overclocking standpoint. It is mm -hmm. a completely new architecture. Uh, in terms of how it's built and all the clocks and multipliers inside of it. So we're going to do some more uh, reading uh, up on that, providing you reading at least uh, for information on that. Maybe we'll be able to overclock the CPU enough to make a little bit, little bit of a difference. Not sure. We'll see. <laughs> want to give away the answer just yet. Uh, but we've got that. We've got a lot of other good stuff coming up too. Uh, how about on Techzilla or HD Nation? Well, uh, Techzilla, we had a lot of fun this, this week. I got to interview Gina Trapani. Um, who is mm -hmm. the fantastic kind of founder of Lifehacker. She also is, is running an open source development crew called ThinkUp right now. Uh, we talk about, uh, Robert Heron and I talk about 1080p versus 720p using 32-inch HDTVs as computer monitor, uh, defragging Dropbox and TrueCrypt, and child-proofing your internet uh, in your home. Um, so the... Uh, Lots of the usual grab bag of tech we hope is useful for everybody coming up on Techzilla this week. Um, and uh, Gina Trapani, who's always really, really fun to interview. You may know her from her other Twitch programs, such as This Week in Google. Yes. Um, and I think that's it for This Week in Twitch. Or I should say This Week in Computer Hardware. Uh, I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.